Today we are going to discuss about the one of the important phylas that is the gynodermata in which we will study the larval forms of the gynoderms which is one of the important questions usually all asked in various competitive examinations and various other examinations. We are talking about the echinoderms, which means prickly skinned or spiny skinned organisms. These are the most beautiful animals uh, of the marine environment. They sea stars, brittle stars, sea urchins, and many other organisms belong to this very group. But today we will restrict ourselves only to the larval forms of the echinoderms. Echinoderms are spiny or prickly skinned animals with calcareous ossicles. When we are going to define the echinoderms in the simplest way, we say that the echinoderms are spiny or prickly skinned organisms with calcareous ossicles derived from the mesodermal tissue, forming an endoskeleton complex series of fluid filled canals. We call them as the water vascular system, derived from the coelomic compartments with two feet as flexible feeding and locomotory appendages. So, echinoderms are anterior coelomates with penta radial symmetry without distinct head or the brain so in order to simplify the firstly echinoderms are spiny or prickly skinned organisms they have a calcareous ossicles which are derived from the mesodermal tissue which forms the endoskeleton and secondly, there is a complex series of fluid filled canals. We call that very as the ambulacral system or the water vascular system. And they have the tube feeds which help in the flexible feeding and which uh, help in the feeding as well. Then they are anterocelous coelomates. One thing is interesting here that the adults they have the penta radial symmetry, whereas they, when we talk about the larval forms, they usually have the they usually have radial or biradial symmetry. And they are um, we shall be talking about their uh, their. Uh, as we are going to talk about the larval forms, uh, so we must be knowing about the their uh, um, sexual nature. Uh, the canoderms are unisexual animals. Sexual dimorphism uh, is absent. That is, there is no distinction between the males and females. Then fertilization takes place in water. Development may be direct or indirect. It means they can give birth to the young ones which resemble that of the adults whereas in another case they give rise to the young ones which do not resemble the adults but they later on due to because of the metamorphosis and changes they then change into the uh, adults the larval form is bilaterally symmetrical and undergo metamorphosis and basic pentamerous symmetry um, pentamerous radially symmetrical adult is developed now um, one uh, thing the first of all we shall be having a glimpse the different larval forms of the different classes of the canoderms we the mostly five classes are there in the phyla echinodermata, phylum echinodermata, that is Asteroidea, Ophiuridea, Echinoidea, Holothuridea, and Crinoidea. Talking about the Asteroidea, it has two larval forms, Bipinaria and Brachiolaria. So, Bipinaria and Brachiolaria, they belong to Brachiolaria, they belong to Asteroidea. Then, Ophiuridea. It has a larval form called as Ophiopluteus. Then we do have the Echinopluteus. It belongs to the class Echinidea. Then Auricularia larva belongs to class Holothuridea. Now, in the case of Holo Holothuridea, in the case of uh, this very Holothuridea, 
the this very uh, along with this very auricularia many a times doliolaria doliolaria this very doliolaria this is also present in the life history stage of the holothuraidea so it means that um, besides auricularia doliolaria is also the larval form of holothuraidea but many a times they don't pass through this valley doliolaria stage but they directly change from auricularia to the adult form but in the case of crinidea it has two that is doliolaria and pentacrinide so um, we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, approximately uh, three classes three classes have two two larval forms that is asteroidia it has bipinaria and brachiolaria then uh, holothuraidea it has auricularia and many a times doliolaria and crinidea it has doliolaria and pentacrinide larval forms whereas two of the classes two cl uh, classes that is ophiuridea and echinidea they have ophiopluteus and echinopluteus and only one one larval form is present in them so we have five classes again i am telling you we have five classes in the case of echinodermata asteroidea having bipinaria and brachiolaria ophiuridea having ophiopluteus echinidea having echinopluteus holothuraidea having auricularia as well as sometimes doliolaria whereas crinidea it has doliolaria and pentacrinide so first of all we shall be talking about the class asteroidea asteroidea it has the larval form which is called as bipinaria larva so two kinds of uh, development uh, do occur in these very organisms direct development which has large yolky uh, eggs but no free swimming larva larval stages present but in the case of indirect development it has homolecithal eggs with little yolk and free swimming larval stage is present so the fertilized egg is homolecithal the first important thing is that the fertilized egg is homolecithal the it undergoes holoblastic cleavage that is whole egg the cleavage takes place in whole of the egg and dwells into blastula and gastrula so gastrula elongates in length and it gives rise to the free swimming bipinaria larva so when the gastro gastrula elongates in length it gives rise to a free swimming bipinaria larva so bipinaria larva is seen in the life history of the starfish this is one of the fascinating creatures of the marine environment and it has a larval stage called as bipinaria so bipinaria is the larval stage of the star so free, this very free swimming larva feeds on diatoms as the alimentary canal is formed so when the yolk is consumed alimentary canal is formed and it starts feeding on the diatoms this the presence of ciliary bands on the stomodial walls helps in feeding many a times the presence of ciliary bands are present on the stomodial walls and they help in the feeding and two little locomotory ciliated bands dwell which connect the front of the mouth forming a preoral loop so this is a preoral loop which is formed in front of the mouth which helps in feeding and secondly secondly the anus is formed so uh, anus so in front of the anus this very pre anal loop is formed this is the pre anal loop is formed so pre oral loop sometimes separate independently to form anterior uh, this uh, ciliate ring around the body three later lobes or projections are also drilled on each side of the body bordered by the ciliary bands so three later lobes or projections are also drilled on each side of the body to um, bordered by the ciliary bands so by this very bipinaria larva um, dwells in 
3 to 7. This is the important point that this very bipinnerial larva develops in 3 to 7 days and is symmetrical. It is symmetrical as we all know when we when we divide it into it can be divided exactly into two that is left portion and right portion. That is why we call it as the bilaterally symmetrical and it is a free swimming pelagic larva. Now when we talk about the pelagic it means it is present in the open sea on the some surface of the sea so as there in the diet of these very organism this very larva is diatoms and the plankton that is why it is present on the upper surface that is why it is a pelagic larva the pre-oral region is elongated as we are um, we are going to see here that this very region is elongated i am going to use another color color here I am taking blue. The pre oral region is elongated. The post oral region is broad. So, this very post oral region is broad and this is elongated. The anterior end forms the pre oral lobe. So, this very lobe is called as the, the whatsoever lobe is present um, just in front of this very portion. We call this as the pre oral lobe. The ciliated band at the preoral lobe forms into two separate bands: the preoral band of the cilia and postoral band of the cilia. And uh, these two bands of the cilia are drawn into many arms. So these very band, uh, bands are drawn into many arms. I am going to discuss here what are these very arms. But keep in mind that whatsoever arms are present in these very lar larva, they have nothing to do with the arms of the starfish. They are temporary here they change and the star uh, st the starfish tells some other kind of the arm so they are now um, we we are going to see here that the first is ventromedian arm this is the ventromedian arm this is the first one the ventromedian arm the second is a pre-oral -pre 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 arm so this is a pair one and two this is a pair of pre oral arm so this portion is complete this is the ventromedian arm this is the pre oral arm this is the pre oral arm so it is in the pre oral arm is in pair whereas the ventromedial um, median arm as the name indicates it is a median arm so it has no pair so median dorsal arm so another um, is median dorsal arm this one this is the median dorsal arm it is also median that is no pair so a pair of anterior dorsal arm a pair of anterior dorsal it is also called as dorsal anterior arm or anterior dorsal arm so this one this one is anterior dorsal arm this is the pair of the anterior dorsal arm a pair of posterior dorsal arm posterior dorsal arm and dorsal posterior arm or posterior dorsal arm this one and this one it is also in pair a pair of posterior lateral arm so these are the posterior lateral arm this is also in pair this one and this one this is the posterior lateral arm these are present in the case of bipinaria now when we see its digestive system it starts from the mouth and ends up at the anus what we are seeing here that it resembles the tornaria larva of the blenoglossus so if there is an objective that uh, to which the bipinaria larva resembles to which any other uh, larva so it the answer is tornaria larva of the blenoglossus and secondly what we see here that this very larva grows slowly into the next larval form which we call it as the brachiolaria larva after free swimming existence for a few weeks the larva grows slowly into the next larval form which is a brachiolaria larva after free swimming extends for few weeks so this very bipinaria larva within three weeks it changes into the brachiolaria larva so after bipinaria larva the next larva we are going to study it is brachiolaria larva it is consecutive to bipinaria larva so after the um, free swimming after swimming for about two to three weeks it changes into a next stage called as the brachiolaria larva 
brachiolaria larva so this again we are seeing here this larva is also bilaterally symmetrical it dwells um, three short arms three now this is very interesting here we have you have to keep in mind that it dwells three short arms at the brachiolar region known as the brachiolar arm so this is the character feature that it is it develops three um, uh, short arms at the brachiolar region known as the brachiolar arms i will show you here that these are the brachiolar arms i am going to use another brachiolar arm so one median and two lateral so this is the median and this is the this is the brachiolar arms these three one one two and this is three so these are three this one this one is median this is uh, this one is median this is the one and this is second this is one this is second and this is third so it has three short brachiolar arms one is median this one without any pair whereas these uh, um, the one and two they are in pairs two lateral arms these arms bear coelomic extensions and adhesive cells at the sucker so we are seeing here that they have some kind of sucker so that it can attach its, itself uh, itself uh, for the purpose of feeding or the for, for the purpose of stagnation now these adhesive structures help in attachment as i told you that this very sucker this is a sucker this is a sucker present here this very this very dark portion sucker present here it helps in the attachment the purpose of this very sucker is attachment the larva shows all the arms that are seen in bipinaria so whatever arms were present in the case of bipinaria but these arms are but these arms are very long and hanging these ciliated arms will be helpful for swimming in the water so whatsoever arms uh, we studied in the case of bipinaria all those arms are present here as well but they are longer than that of the bipinaria larva the digestive system is completely dwelled again here the digestive system is completely dwelled we are seeing the mouth we are seeing the esophagus we are seeing seeing here the stomach uh, stomach and this is the and this is the intestine and this is the anus so digestive system is complete with definite stomach and intestine now um, this larva after swimming few settle on the solid object now after um, few um, days it settle on the solid um, object and gets attached to it by the adhesive organs so this very adhesive organs is for the purpose of the attachment and the posterior end of the larva enlarges the posterior end of the larva enlarges and lifts the right side light right side is lifted and this rudiment of the five arms will rise so the rudiment of the five uh, arm rises and slowly the larva metamorphoses into adult so it's on the first important thing is that it attaches uh, by its adhesive organ it enlarges lifts the right side and the, the rudiment five arms rise thus slowly the larva metamorphoses into adult so this larva slowly metamorphoses into adult in the case of astrobacton in the case of astrobacton uh, what we see that this very brachiolaria stage is missed no brachiolaria stage is uh, present in the case of astrobacton as a result this very bipinaria larva directly metamorphoses into adult within within two to three within two to three months so the exception is the um, what we are seeing here this very astropactin is the exception where in no bipinaria larva is found but this very larva directly bipinaria larva changes directly into the adult after two to three months there is another example that esterina gibosa 
bipinereal again here the bipinereal larval stage is omitted wherein larva dwells in adhesive apparatus as the brachylar arms and sucker uh, sucker and undergoes metamorphosis here again so in these very two cases that is astropactin and asterina gibosa no bipinereal bipinereal um, though no brachylar larval stage is present brachylaria larval stage is present no brachylaria larval stage is present but here bipinereal larva directly changes into adult in the case of ludia in the case of ludia it is a giant and peculiar larval stage is seen and is called as bipinereal aster uh, asteri G and Gera. Asterigera. So, in the case of Lodia, the giant and peculiar larval stage is seen called as bipinereal asterigia. Bipinaria, sorry, it is bipinaria asterigia. Bipinaria, it is not bipinereal, it is bipinaria asterigia. The next larva which we are going to study is Ophiopluteus. This is the larva Ophiopluteus. It belongs to the class Ophiuridea. So the class is Ophiuridea and the larva is Ophiopluteus. This is the third larva which belongs to the class 2 that is Ophiuridea. This is the larval stage which is found in the case of brittle stars. This is the larval stage which is found in the case of brittle stars. So this very pluteous larva, it is a free swimming larva. This is a free swimming larva and is called as Ophiopluteus. So this very larva Ophiopluteus resembles the Echinoproteus larva. Similarly, as in the case of bipinaria larva and brachiolaria larva, there is resemblance except in the uh, size of the appendages. But in the case of uh, Ophiopluteus and Echinoproteus, there is resemblance except the number of the append appendages. So, the Echinoproteus has the um, more number of appendages than that of the Ophiopluteus. That is our next larva which shall be studying. This way, and um, one more thing is here that these are the posterior lateral arms. These are the first arms which develop. These are the first arms to develop, and these are the longest arms and directed forwards. So after gastrulation, the, these are the uh, first arms which develop. We call them as the posterior posterior lateral arm. Then, then we do have then then there are other arms uh, such as the this very this very arm it is the anterolateral arm anterolateral arm it dwells after four uh, approximately four days so this very arm dwells after about four days then we do have the postural uh, arm it dwells after about ten days and then we do have the posterior dorsal arm it dwells after about eighteen days of gastrulation. So we do have uh, we do have the anterolateral arm anterolateral arm uh, which dwells uh, four days after gastrulation then the postural arm which dwells after about ten days of the gastrulation and then we do have the posterior dorsal arm which this very this very arm this very posterior dorsal arm this dwells after about eighteen days of gastrulation. Uh, this very larva shows many long arms. It is again this very larva is uh, pelagic, pelagic, uh, bi bilaterally symmetrical. This is the bilaterally symmetrical larva and is transparent. This very larva is uh, transparent and supported by calcareous rods which are directed upwards. Here what we are what we are seeing here in this very case the preoral loop is reduced that this very loop this very loop is reduced this very loop what we are uh, seeing here this very loop is reduced otherwise it was like uh, this in the case of um, brachiolaria larva and bipinaria larva so this pre oral loop is reduced here ciliated bands are undivided the digestive system is developed it opens uh, from, from the mouth and ends up at the anus the larva uh, swims for some time before undergoing metamorphosis and there is no attachment stage so in this very case of your there is no attachment Stage. So, larva has no suckers for the attachment. 
the tiny serpent star sinks to the bottom what happens in this very case it sinks to the bottom for the adult existence so when it has to change metamorphose into the adult it changes its behavior from the pelagic free swimming larva and it settles down um, at the bottom to for the adult existence so um, amphiura vivipara is a viviparous form and has no plutus so the, uh, earlier we also studied some exceptions here also the exceptions are there amphiura vivipara is a viviparous form it has no pluteal stage and in case of uh, ophionotus ophionotus uh, hexactis development takes place in ovary and aborted pluteus larva is divided of arms in us so in this very case we are going to study two exceptions the first exception that amphiura uh, vivipara uh, it is viviparous and no with no larval uh, form and secondly ophionotus hexactis where the development takes place in ovary and aborted pluteus larva is divided so this very larva of the ophionotus hexactis is divided of arms so it means it means this very larva has uh, is divided of arms and anus and so uh, one exception is ophionotus hexactis where in the uh, in larva which is um, which comes out has is divided of arms and anus whereas in the case of in the case of amphiura vivipara um, the larval stage uh, in in this very case is um, has no gluteus stage then the next larva is um, belongs to class echinidea and the larva is a kinopluteus. I was telling you about in the earlier case um, is ophiopluteus and a kinopluteus. There is, there is a resemblance, but only in, in the number of the appendages are different. So this is the life history, um, the larval form shown in the case of the larval history of the echinidea echinidea it is a microscopic larva microscopic larva and dwells in 7 to 30 days 7 to 30 days it dwells and the larva is formed after gastrulation the it, it becomes conical uh, conical one side of which flattens to form the oral surface so this very um, side flattens to form the oral surface the stomodial invagination invagination communicates with archentron and the gut is differentiated into mouth stomach and the intestines similar to the other uh, larvae we are in the mouth esophagus stomach and this very anus is also present then blastopore remains at the larval anus the this very blastopore blastopore remains at the larval anus the larva shows ciliated bands which are dwelt into arms ciliated bands uh, are seen in the case of the larva which dwell into various arms uh, in fully dwelled echinopluteus larva four or five pairs, pairs of the arms are present four or five pairs of the arms are present but mostly six pairs of the arms result mostly it is the four to five pairs are present but uh, many a times six pairs of the arms should be resulted but um, it is it means that six pairs of the arms are common but many a times four or five pairs of arms are then anterior dorsal uh, post posterior this is the posterior arm the anterior dorsal is not depicted here then posterior dorsal then posterior dorsal arm and posterior lateral arm and then posterior lateral arm um is also present which is not uh, depicted here as well these arms are uh, supported by calcium carbonate that is calcareous rods to provide them strength the digestive system is dwelled which shows mouth which shows mouth as well as the anus is shown here the mouth i am going to show you here this is the mouth Oh, and this is the this is the anus uh, it develops uh, hydrocele and vestibule as well these parts grow on the oral side of the animal from the hydrocele five radial canals will dwell so um, radial ca canals dwell from the hydrocele hydrocele which gives rise to the uh, five um, radial canals in um, Ar arabasia and sideris larva develop special ciliated lobes between arm bases known as appellates um, many times these very appellates these very appellates 
the, the here these are depicted at the as the posterior epaulets but many a times many a times some of the epaulets are present here uh, here as well and uh, here like this they are present uh, as the epaulets these are present as the epaulets the larva undergoes rapid metamorphosis and dwells into adult within an hour so this is the um, important thing that within within an hour this is a quick metamorphosis and within an hour this very larva changes into adult the next larva is auricularia larva it belongs to class holothuridea holothuridea so after gastrulation and the formation of coelomic sacs and gut the embryo becomes a free swimming larva this very embryo becomes a free swimming larva uh, and is called auricularia larva this very larva is auricularia larva within three days so it takes three days to develop um, after gastrulation it changes into the auricularia larva within three days it is again free swimming it is again free swimming transparent pelagic larva about 0.5 to 1 mm in length and it swims with the help of ciliated band uh, which form the pre oral loop so here um, these these are the pre oral loops with which it um, it um, these very pre oral loops help in the swimming of this very larva um, the arms are absent um, as the arms are absent so it swims with the help of these very pre oral loops so alimentary canal is developed it uh, it um, opens uh, yeah, the mouth and ends up uh, again ns uh, ns here the intestine is little bit curved and in in japan and bermuda very big auricularia larva forms are developed in the in in japan and bermuda large larval uh, auricularia larval forms have been um, seen they are about 15 mm in length so not only microscopic but visible uh, can be visible up to uh, these it means it 1.5 centimeter larva and usually this larva is 1 mm so 0 0.1 centimeter uh, but here in japan and bermuda they are about 1.5 centimeter ciliated bands are well developed ciliated band continue through the oral loop and the anal loop so they form the oral loop as well as the anal loop are formed so next larva is doliolaria larva doliolaria the, as i have told you that this very doliolaria larva is uh, also present in the holothuridea as well but it is mostly in the presence of crinidea but you can write it as that the doliolaria larva is also the larval form of the um, this very holo um, holothuridea but many a times it skips this very larval phase but the larva larva is same so the the characteristic feature of the same so in crinidia a group of animals the larval form is doliolaria so this is the doliolaria larva it is free swimming larval form the body shows four or five ciliated bands uh, the, these are the ciliated bands we, we call it as tuft of the ciliary cilia so it is called as apical tuft uh, these are these are mostly sensory in nature these are sensory in nature on the mid ventral line near the apical plate adhesive pit um, this very adhesive pit can be seen in between second and the th um, third and second ciliated um, ciliated bands vestibule is present this is the second and the third um, plate this very vestibule vestibule can be seen here vestibule can be seen here after swimming for some time it dwells a stalk called a cystidium or pentacrinide larva so when it dwells this very larva that is doliolaria larva dwells a star we now call it as a pentacrinide or cystidium uh, cystidium larva so it helps in the attachment uh, to the substratum the internal organs rotate at 90 degree and it dwells into the adult so when this doliolaria larva dwells is stuck we call it as a cystidian or pentacrinide larva so what happens when this attaches it rotates its internal organs 90 degree and it dwells into an adult now little bit of brush up 
why why this very larval uh, why it is very much uh, necessary for us to study uh, these very larval stages the first thing is that the uh, the common origin of the classes um, is known by the study of these very echinoderm larva the uh, as we study the except larva of the crinidia which become sedentary sedentary others have the functional resemblance so um, we came to know that except the larva of crinidia which becomes sedentary the others have the functional resemblance mm -hmm. that they are constructed on the same general fundamental plan all are um, all are constructed are uh, made uh, on the same general plan that is they have the uh, they have the flattened body they have the longitudinal looped ciliated bands and the gut and anterior uh, silk coelom is but when we compare the echinoderm dermata larva um, by st for studying the origin of the caudates we also conclude certain things such as it has an establishment um, that echinoderm is very near to caudate so first thing that echinoderms are very near to caudate many scientists um, attempt to prove that the caudates have been originated from the echinoderms then uh, echinoderms uh, hemicaudates tumicules uh, um, tumicules um, and the higher chordates are together placed under a group called as deuterostoma deuterostoma due to secondary development of oral aperture due to secondary development of the oral aperture and so as we all know that protostomia are those very organisms we are in the mouth dwells dwell first whereas in the case of deuterostomia the uh, anus dwells uh, dwells first so um, so as like that of the higher chordates the echinoderms also have the um, they are also deuterostomes so in this view the similarities uh, similarly some uh, important views are described here so for example we are going to see some of the important views the first is similarity about the morphology and anatomy the bilateral symmetry of the auricularia of the echinoderm is similar to torn area i have discussed this in very first slide that the auricularia larva resembles to that of the torn area of the blanoglossus so this very similar similarity indicates um, indicates the similarity uh, between these two very organisms um, and secondly the cleavage pattern looping bands anterocilic origin of the coelom and body cavity this indicates the similarity according to willi according to willi uh, echinoderms descend from the bilateral symmetrical pelagic organism so general likeness between the auricularia and torn torn area is so great that it can be accounted for on ground of the genetic affinity so this the similarity between these two can be accounted for on ground of the genetic uh, genetic affinity as well the similarity between bipinaria and torn area larva according to mashinikov 1869 um, what he uh, concluded that free swimming and the bilaterally symmetrical larval form in the both the uh, both bipinaria and the torn area larva have um, the free swimming and bilaterally symmetrical larva transparent and similar ciliated bands are present in both of them similar location of mouth and anus and then madriporic um, vesicle in bipinaria are thought as homologous this very uh, madriporic vesicle in bipinaria are thought as homologous with heart vesicle of the blanoglossus the madriporic vesicle in bipinaria are thought as homologous with the heart of the uh, blanoglossus talking about the taxonomic affinities um, we see here that the larval similarities do not indicate the taxonomic um, affinities so among uh, you uh, you thirozoa uh, elu thirozoa two well dwelled larval forms that is plotius and auricularia Uh, when we compare these two the proteus with two arms and bilateral symmetry uh, and it is um, it is it belongs to ophiuridea and uh, echinidea whereas auricularia group it um, it has asteroidea and holothuridea with ciliated bands so the proteus larva 
with two arms and bilateral symmetry whereas in the auricularia group they have the ciliated bands so on the basis of larval taxonomy ophiuridia should be placed near echinidea so ophiuridia and echinidea and asteridia they should be close uh, close to uh, to holothuridia but it is not common in arrangement from the paleontological and morphological studies but when we study the fossils as well as the morphology this is uh, not common this is not common all larval forms have bilateral symmetrically symmetry hence it is believed that the ancestor of the echinoderms was bilaterally symmetrical animal the first thing the bilateral symmetry that uh, this very bilateral, bilateral symmetry, uh, symmetry indicates that their ancestor was bilaterally symmetrical uh, the one of the another view by the bather 1900 the ancestor was called dipleurula uh, ple, uh, pleurula dipleurula and according to semen 1988 the ancestor was called pen, pentitula pentitula the pentitula ancestor was universally accepted so there were two views in this very similarity that according to bather dipleural larva was ancestor whereas according to the semen the uh, pentitula was the uh, ancestor and this very pentitula is universally accepted when we talk about the radial symmetry exhibited by the cilentrate and porifera porifera is primary so radial symmetry exhibited by the cilentrate and porifera is primary but the radial symmetry in the case of echinoderms is superficial concealing the true bilateral symmetry so it conceals the true bilateral symmetry adult echinoderms are more primitive than larva what we see here that the adult uh, echinoderms seem to be more primitive than larva as they possess the features which are of lower animals like porifera and cilentrata whereas the larva have the advanced character than that of the than that of the adults the primitive characters are radial symmetry absence of the head lack of anterior and posterior ends so we don't differentiate that what is anterior and what is the posterior in the case of adult uh, echinoderms hence during the metamorphosis the advanced larva becomes a primitive adult so this is one of the interesting thing that what is to be seen that uh, it is believed by the scientists that uh, the larva are advanced than that of the adult and after metamorphosis the advanced larva becomes a primitive adult and hence we call this very process are the metamorphosis as the retrogressive metamorphosis again uh, here the larval forms of the all classes in echinodermata uh, will show general resemblance secondly crinidia larva differs from this pattern crinidia larva it differs from this very pattern in general all the larva show they might come from the same ancestor and hence the common ancestor is a coelomate bilaterally symmetrical and free swimming so these larvae also show resemblance to tornaria of lanoglossus which we have discussed earlier thus the study echinoderm larva has a phylogenetic significance this indicates that very um, echinoderm larva has phylogenetic significance thank you very much